So that's going to be March 23rd. I believe it's Wednesday. Okay? So write it down in your calendar. It covers everything up to that point. I'll give you more information later. Okay? Now, because of this, we have to make a small, very small change to the next problem set. So the thing is that you usually have a week, right? So I make an announcement to matter, and that's due by the next Wednesday. But, you know, the Wednesday we have this quiz, and I really have to give you my solutions uh, for the problem set so that you're, you're prepared, okay? So I'm going to make it uh, in this way. I'm going to uh, announce the uh, assignment today, okay? So only, the, only this week. Let's change the date slightly, so just one day earlier. So you have your assignment today. That's assignment three, not two, not the current assignment, the, the next one. So it will be announced tonight, and the due date is by next Tuesday, right? It has to be by next Tuesday. Then you just submit it, you get my solution, and maybe you can study it a little bit. Does it make sense? How's your, how's your homework going? Do you have any questions? Not yet? Have you tried? So uh, we are going to cover some. So you know, when, we, when we discuss those topics, make sure that you ask questions, OK? And today, um, I finished the class a little bit earlier. I have a meeting at 5, so it ended at 5. Okay? I have a meeting the second floor, so um, we we'll finish around that time. OK, um, what else? Uh, one thing, though. In this first quiz, I'm not going to ask any R questions. OK? So there's no R. I just want to give you more time so that you get you, you can you can feel more comfortable. <coughs> so my main goal is to review a few things that you really have to know do the assignment, the second assignment that you're currently doing. So let's move quickly. So in the last time, one important thing was the conditional probability, right? So I told you that the data provides a joint. And then you summarize, you analyze data, produce marginal, and eventually conditional. And that's how you find your answer. So it's very important. And uh, we, review, we review the mean and variance. Remember this definition. And then we had a little exercise. Now, today, I like to review a related concept, which is the conditional mean and the conditional variance. So let me let me show you two definitions. This is the definition of the conditional mean of y given a value of x. So it's like, what is my average commuting time, given that I know that it's quite bad outside. Otherwise, right? that's the meaning of condition on me. So take a look at the definition. And let's compare the conditional mean to the mean. So sometimes I call it a unconditional mean. So that's the opposite of conditional. Mean. When I say unconditional mean, this is what I mean. Sometimes I'm going to call it a marginal mean. Okay? So this is a terminology. So what's the difference between two? So that's the marginal mean, just my commuting time, for example. 
this is the condition of my commuting time, my average commuting time, given that it's raining. So what's the, di what's the difference? Can somebody tell me? Again, that's the conditional mean. That's the marginal mean. I mean, there's y and x, but besides that, do you see any difference between two? It's almost the same thing, right? Right, so the difference is you use a conditional probability here, but you use a marginal probability. That's the only difference. Okay? Otherwise, it's basically the same definition. Now, let's see the uh, variance. That's the marginal variance or unconditional variance. This is the conditional variance. There are two differences. What difference do you see? By the way, the meaning is the variation in my commuting time if I know that it's raining outside. Okay? That's what it means. Now, what difference do you see? So that's conditional. This is marginal. Take a look at the center. For the marginal variance, the center is the marginal mean, right? And the conditional variance, the center is the conditional mean. It's the first difference. This is the center. So I subtract the value of y from its center. So remember that. That's one difference. The second difference is the probability. So here we use conditional probability. Here we use marginal probability. OK? So that's the definition. Now, the first question in your problem set that you're working on is the last exercise in day three reading guide. Yes. Let's take a look at this. Now, let me ask you this. Did you do it? Did you get the answer? Day three, reading guide, additional exercise. Let me ask you this. So what is the mean of y given that x is equal to 0? What did you get? <coughs> point 0.8. Did you get point 0.8? You sure? So the answer is 0 0.8. If you got it right, you're on the right track. So how did you do that? You just apply that definition, right? So y only takes 0 and 1, takes two values, and you multiply those values with probabilities. So it's 0, the value of y, and the probability that y takes 0, given that x is 0. 1, the value of y. And then you multiply the probability. Right? So 0 times something just vanishes. So what's left is this guy. And then what? Right. 
So how to find this conditional probability? The conditional is joint divided by the marginal, right? Can you see it? Now what is this? <coughs> What's the joint probability in this table? Y gets 1, X gets 0. So the denominator is, the numerator is 0.4. What's the denominator? Marginal probability of X equal to 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. So that's 0.8. So did you get it right? Now let's see part B. So how do you do it? So the definition just remains the same. But instead of using y, you're supposed to use y squared for the value. And the probability does not change. So y gets 0. And y gets 1. So this time disappears. So what's the answer? <coughs> what's the answer? It's 0.8. There's no difference, right? It's because y only takes 0 and 1. If it takes 1 and 2, the answer is, of course, very different. What is the variance of i given that x is equal to 0? So how do you get the variance? Suppose that you know the first moment and second moment. Can you find out the variance? The variance of x is equal to e of x squared minus e of x squared, the whole thing, right? Same for the conditional variance. So I, um, I did the first part and please the second one. Okay, make sure that you get the right answer. Do you have any questions so far? Now, if you have a textbook, take a look at exercise. 2.6, I believe. Is it right? The last two questions in your problem set are exercise 2.5 and 2.6. Do you see that it's basically the same question, the same problem? just provide more meaning, right? So here, in this exercise, x means education, the degree of education. x gets 0 means that you don't have any college degree. x gets 1 means that you have a college, college degree. And y means the state of unemployment. So y takes 0 means you're employed. y takes 1 means you are employed. Okay? But besides that, it's the same question. 
So do you think you can do it? There's basically no difference between this one and the exercise 2.6 in the text. So try it. Try it tonight. Do you have any questions so far? No? Okay. Now let me let me tell you something that is actually very powerful. So the name is the law of iterated expectation. Did you see it before in your statistics? Did you learn it before? Now this is one of the very powerful um, technique that we are going to use. So suppose that I'm trying to show you something in front of you. I'm writing something, very long mathematics, calculations, whatever. And suppose that you just got lost. You couldn't follow, okay? Perhaps you're very tired or sleepy. And there's something quite magical happening. I did something very clever and get something very unexpected. Usually the chance is that I use this law, okay? So whenever something that looks quite nice, clever, the chance is I just use this law, okay? That's the law of iterated expectation. So I think some of you have seen it before, but let me just review it. So basically it says there are two ways to get the mean of a random variable, for example y. But you can switch, it can be x, it can be y, it really doesn't matter. So the first way is you just take the mean. Like mean of y, you type in R, okay? Mean, you open the parentheses, and age, or income, or height, whatever, and you close parentheses. That's one way. So in some sense, this is an easier way. A harder way is you get the conditional mean. There may be several conditional means, depending on the value of x. If x takes 0 and 1, there are two conditional means. Mean of y when x is equal to 0, mean of y when x is equal to 1. So you get two conditional means, and then you take the average using the distribution of x. So this is a harder way. But this law says they are always the same. Okay? So let me give you an example. So in the first example, let's say that y is height. In my class, and x is gender. Okay? So suppose that it takes 1 for female and 0 for male. So again, how do you get the average height? of this class. There are two methods. Okay? The method on the uh, right hand side basically says we like to know the average height of women. Oh, sorry. Zero means male. So this is the average height of female, okay? Suppose that this is given, and suppose that we also know the average height of men. And suppose we know that how many women are there, so that's the probability of x gets 1, the weight of female. And if you know the probability of man, 
then you can find out the average height. Now, does it make sense? Let me give you an example. Suppose that one half of our class is female, and their conditional mean height is uh, in, in meter 1.6 plus one half of our class male and the conditional their conditional mean height 1.8 then if you take the average of these two conditional means you get 1.7 which is the class average height okay now does it make sense so this is at least one way to calculate the mean the class average so the left-hand side is the left-hand side over there. Take a look at the right-hand side. What this means? So basically, we take the conditional mean, two of them, depending on the value of x. And we take the weighted average. It's the meaning of taking the expectation, the outer expectation. So taking the expectation of this conditional mean using the value of x means we use the probability of each value of x. So we know the uh, conditional mean, one conditional mean for the female, and we know the fraction of female in class. We know the conditional mean of male, we know the fraction of males in this class. We take the weighted mean, weighted average, that's the meaning of taking the mean of conditional mean. So here, the input is the conditional means. You already kind of process the data once. You get two conditional means. And if you take the weighted average again, then you're going to have the overall weight, overall mean. OK? So that's what it says. Does it make sense? So why we do this is because it kind of looks a longer way of getting the same thing operationally. But Mathematically, it makes a lot of things very convenient, easier. You basically take one chunk of problem, you chop it down into many different slices. It's the meaning of taking conditional mean. And then you take care of each slice, and then you add them up. That's the meaning of the out expectation. So mathematically, it's a very nice trick. So again, this is very general. It doesn't have to be x and y. It can be w, it can be s, anything. And you can change the order. OK? As long as you don't, so, but the order is important. So if you want to know the uh, mean of y, you have to use as an input the conditional mean of y given some other variable, OK? So you cannot, you cannot switch the order from here. So this variable must come first on the left-hand side. So there are a lot of examples. So this is one example. A second example is probably um, y is wages and x is age. Suppose that we divide people into three groups depending on their age. age. Very young, middle age, and old. Okay? So age is less than 29. Age is between 30 and maybe 42. And age is bigger than 42. Something like that. Now, how do you get the average wages of the whole society? Now, again, you can chop it down. One way to get the, uh, the entire, entire mean is to get three conditional mean. Y given, so this is the average wages of young people. And you have to know the fraction of young people. How many young people are there? Average wages of middle-aged, and you have to know their fraction. 
average wages of old. And if you know the fraction, if you add them up, again, that's how you calculate the, uh, the mean for the society. Okay? So that's what it says. Now, let me give you an exercise um, to show you how powerful it can be. <coughs> Do you know the, the meaning of this notation? X follows a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1, right? That's what it means. So in this exercise, by the way, this is coming from the textbook. Let me give you the number. So I just tried to solve maybe the beginning of the whole problem. So this is question number 2.23. Two, so if you're interested, please read this. So basically, this is the question. We have two normal random variables, and they're independent. Okay. Now we define a new random variable y, which is x squared plus g. The question is, what is the mean of y, and what is the variance of y? Or you can go further. What is the distribution of y? So what is the mean? What is the variance? Variance is a little harder. So it takes time, so let me, let me not do it today. I just focus on this question. What is the mean of y? This is usually a quite difficult question. Now, when you have two normal random variables, if you add them up, we know that the addition follows another normal random variable, right? So that's easier. So if, we have the y, if y is x plus g, we know the answer right away, right? So the mean of y is sum of two means for x and g. Now if you square something, or if you multiply two random variables, it becomes a lot harder. You usually don't know how to find the mean and values. You, just, you have to use a lot of calculations. Now if you use this law, the law of iterative expectation, we can do it very easily. Okay? So try this. I'll give you a few minutes. So let me break it down into two steps. Can you try? Actually, the answer is the mean of y is equal to 1. But the real question is why. So I just break it down for you. So try to make an argument like this. And then you use the law of iterative expectation and finally find the answer. OK? Try. I'll give you two minutes. <coughs> Now let me do the first step, and I'll give you another maybe a minute or two for the second step. 
So let's think about the conditional mean of y given x. y is x squared plus g given x. The expectation is just a summation. Okay? So you can change the expectation and plus the addition. Is it okay? Now listen carefully. What's the mean of x squared if you know the value of x? That's what it means. Again, the average value of x squared if you know the value of x. So suppose that x is 2.5. You know that. It's the meaning of conditional on x. This is 2.5. What is the mean of x squared? That's 2.5 squared. Right? The value is just not specified. So what is the mean of g given that you know the value of x? But they're independent. Independent means they don't affect each other. So it's kind of too early to tell you this, but this is the same as this. Does it make sense? Knowing x or not does not change anything about g. It's the meaning of being independent. Now, what is, what is the mean of G? So that's part one. Now, you know the conditional mean, right? So use this conditional mean and use this love iterative expectation. And then you'll see the answer. So do part B, the second one. So why do you have this equality? That's the law, right? That's the law. Why do you have this equality? <coughs> the conditional mean of y given x is x squared. <coughs> so what is e of x squared? One. That's 1. But it's variance of x plus e of x <coughs> squared, right? This is something you really have to know from your statistics. Otherwise, uh, you have to review a lot, okay? So that's why it is one. Now, is it new to you? Is it hard? Tricky? Don't worry. I'll give you a lot of exercises. So um, I just decided that for the next problem set, I'm going to give you um, maybe three or four of something like this. So you're going to have a chance to learn. OK, let's move on. Now, again, this is another review from the statistics. When two random variables are independent. So let's go back to our favorite example. Y is your commuting time. X is the weather. So what is the probability that I have a short or long commute conditioned on that I know the weather? Suppose that that's the same as the probability that I have a long commute without knowing anything about the weather. Suppose that that's the case for any value of y and any value of x. What does it mean for x and y? They don't affect. They don't affect, right? So x does not affect y. Y does not affect x. It's a meaning of independence. If this is the case, does it make sense? So when conditional probability is always, the important thing is always equal to marginal probability, we say that two random variables are independent. And in statistics, you also learn that. Another way to say the same thing is the joint probability is a product of two marginal probabilities, right? This again, definition of the independence. This has to be the case for every value of x in one. Again, if you're not familiar with this, you have to review um, the statistics. Perhaps you can use your textbook or read chapter two of our text.
Stagnus. By the way, did you buy the book? Did you do that? Yes. Okay. Now, sum of two random variables, or more than two random variables. Again, this is um, an important concept. And I believe that you know this from your statistics. So we have two random variables, x and y. Suppose that x is the income from your husband, y is income from your wife. OK? What is x plus y, then? The sum of income from husband and wife. So this is a family income, okay? Assuming that they both have works. Now, what does it mean? The average family income is always in equal to average income of husbands plus average income of wife. Does it make sense? Suppose there are 5,000 couples and everybody work. Then how do you find out the mean wages of those 5,000 households. So this is one way. You just find out the mean wages for the husband and the mean wages for wife. So that's the uh, law of expectation. So again, expectation preserve the order between the expected value summation and addition. So you can add them up and take expectation, or you can take expectation and then add them up later. Doesn't matter. But the variance does not preserve the order. Because you know, if you change the order, you get a different answer. What is the variation of family income? Suppose that we ignore this term. Is it equal to the variation of husband's income plus variations of wife's income? No, sometimes it can be much bigger than that. Sometimes it can be smaller than that because of these two times covariance. Do you remember this? I mean, example is, suppose that um, both are accountants, okay? And suppose that, you know, their wages are very sensitive to the business cycle. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Maybe it is a factor or not, but suppose that that's the case. The husband is an accountant, wife is an accountant. The variation of their family income can be much bigger than the sum of variations for the husbands and wives because they always move together. The variation of the whole income is much greater. So sometimes you have a variation which is much bigger than these two terms. But if you have jobs such that your incomes move the other way all the time, so that's a good example. So husband sells ice cream. <coughs> wife sells something else, like hot coffee. Okay? Their variations of their family income can be much smaller than the, the sum of two variations because they cancel out. I'm not sure that's a good example, but that's the law of variance. So the variance does not preserve the order. Now that's something to remember. I'm sure there's a lot. Uh, in statistics class, I usually spend a lot of time, maybe uh, a week or two, to study this, explain exact meaning for this. But uh, I don't think we have such time for this class. So uh, what you have to do is just take a look at this list. This is not everything you have to know, but this is almost everything you need to know, okay? So there is something missing here and there, but it's almost exclusive. So just take a look at this list from time to time. And whenever you have an exercise practice, just try to find some clue from there. OK? Now take a look at exercise one from day four reading guide. That's again one of the um, problem set. Now why don't you try if you haven't? Basically, I want you to use one of these things, the law of expectation, law of variance, law of covariance, to solve this problem. So that's day four reading guide, exercise one.
e of 3 plus 6x. So there's a lot of laws, right? So which one do you want to apply? Law of expectation, first one. So that's 3 plus 6 times e of x. 3 plus 6 times e of x is 2. So the answer is 15. OK? Did you get it? Now the second, the b says, how about variance? Now you apply one of these laws, and you should be able to complete. Try if you haven't. When you add a constant to the variance, does it change anything? No. Suppose that we have a distribution of the test score. Now I said, I'm going to give everybody three more points. That's pure bonus. Three more points for everybody. Does it change the variance of the score of the class? No. The variance does not matter. It just drops out. Does it change the mean score? Yes. So that's why the expected value the constant does not drop out. But for the variance, it just drops out. Now, if I say, this is the original score, I'm going to multiply it by 6 for some reason. It's like crazy. Does it change the variance? Suppose you have 89. I, I promise. I multiply it by 6 for everybody. Now, does it change the variance? Yes, a lot. So I just <coughs> apply this law, right? Variance of a plus b times y. Now this a just drops out because adding a constant does not change anything for the variability. But b comes out with b squared. So you can complete the calculation. Now c is harder. The covariance is always harder. How are you going to do it? Again, you, you find one of the uh, right law to apply. And it seems like that uh, this is good to know. This is good to apply, right? Just apply this, try it. Sometimes this is good to apply too. OK? Now, when you add a constant to a random variable, does it change any covariance to the relationship between x and y? Suppose that this is your midterm score. This is your final score. So your midterm score, I just give bonus 10 points to everybody. Does it change any correlation or covariance between the midterm and final? No. That's why plus constant does not affect anything. It just drops out. But if you multiply by 1.5 for the midterm, does it change the covariance? Yes. Just take it out. But here, there's no b squared, just b, OK? And it preserves the sign. So remember these things, and I'm pretty sure that you can solve it. So try. So again, um, as I said many times, you can help each other. So work as a group, work together. Just so remember that you have to write down your own solution. Now my final um, thing to do is in the textbook, there is a exercise 2.5. So suppose that C means the uh, temperature in Celsius. Can it be a random variable? Before today, do you know today's temperature in Celsius? For sure? No. After today, do you know? Yes, so it's a random variable. Now it's a relationship. 
So how do you find out information like this? The relationship between Celsius and Fahrenheit. How do you normally do? Just ask it, right? Yesterday I asked in Google, and the Google says Celsius is Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. So that's the relationship. The question is, we know the mean and variance in Fahrenheit. Where is the mean and variance in Celsius? So can you imagine that we can solve it? Do you have an idea how to do it? Again, this is basically exactly the same as the uh, problems we just solved, S and T. The same thing, right? If you know the mean and variance for F, you can figure out the mean and variance of C using one of these, these rules. <coughs> Okay, so uh, that's four questions in your problem set two. Do you think you can do them? Can you do it? Do you think you can do it? That's matter. Okay. Again, work together. You have to do it tonight. And um, help each other. Now, uh, it's over five. But I, I, I think that... Um, I can give you the exercise right now. So write down the exercise, the problem set, the next problem set. <coughs>